For more than 40 years, Gallup polls have gone out and they've been asking questions, lots of questions, but for 40 years they've asked two questions. And the first question is this, do you believe the Bible is the actual word of God and is to be taken literally word for word? Back in the 80s, the the percentage was about 35%. Uh, Today, it is 20%. We've dropped. We've noticed something because something else, the time that the the believability of the Bible is dropping down, there's another that is going up. The second question that they ask is this. Do you believe the Bible is a book of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts recorded by man? And this number has been growing up. Right now, it's 29%. So five years ago, these two numbers, we believe, you know, where I believe the Bible to be true and fables, these were like here and then they crossed five years ago. And you say, well, Rich, why is this important? This is important because the culture in which you and I lived and we talk about Jesus in, we're living in a culture where people, by and large, four out of five do not believe that the Bible is the word of God. So as we are speaking about the gospel and we say, hey, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that means nothing to them because they, four out of five people, do not even believe that the Bible is reliable or trustworthy. Let, let me tell you, let me read a verse to you, what the Bible says about itself. So here it goes. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it says this, all scripture, in the Greek, this is signifying both the Old and the New Testament, From Genesis to Revelation, all Scripture is breathed out by God. Some of your translations might have the word inspired by God. Actually, literally, it's God-breathed. And profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be equipped, excuse me, may be complete, equipped for every good work. This morning, I want to ask a question that every single follower of Jesus should be able to answer. The question is this. The Bible, can it be trusted? The Bible, can it be trusted? Again, 29% believe it's fables, myths, and all the rest. And I I just want to say this morning, I know that this morning I'm speaking to people who believe the Bible to be true. Many of you said, this has been settled for me a long time ago. There's others here that are not sure, especially when you say all Scripture. There's parts of Scripture that people are trying to throw out right now, and they say, yeah, maybe it is a little bit. You know, it's been copied and, 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 uh, and changed over time, and so maybe I don't believe in the complete inspiration God breathed out part of of scripture so uh some of you who don't believe that don't believe that the the scriptures are inspired are thinking rich i I don't like the way you started you started by quoting second timothy 3 16 and 17 and you said that all scripture is inspired or god breathed out and you're saying that's circular reasoning what you're doing is you're taking the bible and you're saying see the bible says it is true now, I want to share with you this because I, normally, those of you that, that, that come here and are part of our church family, you know that I'm a guy that likes to go verse by verse by verse because that's how I'm wired. I think we will not go wrong if we stay true to the Word of God. But this morning, I'm going to deviate from that a little bit because this is a pressing issue that our culture is, is uh, walking in a different step than you and I are today. For, for most of my life... If, upbringing and all. I grew up in a Christian home. I come from a long line of Christians, and I believe the Bible. I thought it was God's Word. We used to say, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. How many of you remember hearing that? Okay, real simple. I don't have to defend it. God said it. I believe it. That settles it for me. So that's how I was. Along the way, uh, in high school, I came, I became friends with somebody who claimed to be an atheist. I'd heard about atheists, but I'd never seen one before. (laughs) And so he starts to tell me that he's an atheist, and he starts to pepper and pick away at everything that I'm saying. Now, atheist, I want you to know, it was a shock to me because he didn't have horns, and he didn't have 666 printed on his, tattooed on his forehead, and he didn't have a black cape. He was a really nice guy. He's still my friend to this day, by the way. But he started challenging me, and he started saying, 
you keep claiming the Bible is the word of God, why, it, it, you know, the Bible, can it be really trusted? And my best answer, he goes, why do you believe the Bible? And my best answer was, my mom and dad tell me it's true. Sadly, that's the way many people in the church are today. We believe it because our pastor says it's true. We, we believe it because our, our parents told us that it is true. But most people in our culture believe that it's a fable. More people believe that than believe that it's the Bible, it's the Word of God. And you should be equipped, though, to be able to answer this question. The Bible, can it be trusted? Now, before I get into that, let me tell you that all people are people of faith. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. The Christians, we're people of faith. The Muslims we're, are people of faith. Judea, Jews are people of faith. Atheists are people of faith. You say, they don't believe in God, though. They believe that there's no God. They're people of faith. They can't prove that there's a God no more than we can prove that there is a God. If we go into the, the uh, a laboratory, a science lab, we can't prove it. They can't prove it. We are all people of faith. But let me tell you something. Having walked with Jesus for 60 years now, I know, I don't look that old. Uh, You're not supposed to laugh quite so quickly. <laughs> and having been a pastor, preaching from a, up front for 38 years, I believe the Bible to be the inspired word of God more today than ever before. And it's not because my dad told me it's true. So what I want us to do this morning is I'm going to tell you four reasons why I believe the Bible is true and why you should believe that the Bible is true. The first reason is this. It is the most reliable collection of ancient writings. It is the most reliable collection of ancient writings. Many people say you can't trust the Bible because it's an old book from ancient times Passed down from generation to generation. Copies were made along the way. There's so many translations. How do we even know what they originally said? And again, 29% of the people say that, that it's just a book of fables and myths and legends. But if anybody comes to you or to me and they say to us that I don't believe the Bible because it is unreliable, it's an unreliable collection of ancient writings, has not done an honest analysis of the historical accuracy of the Bible. In history, accuracy of ancient writer, writings is primarily determined by two things. Ancient writings, the accuracy of ancient writer is determined by two things. Stay with me. I know the coffee hasn't kicked in yet, and I'm going to go into the deep ends just for a minute. It's going to be worth it. Stay with me. The first thing is this. How many copies do we have how many copies of the, of the writing exist? Now, you've got to remember, these books, the Bible, and books like it, were written before there were fax machines, emails, and copy and paste. None of those things existed. They were originally written by one person. They were then shown to somebody. That person would copy it. Another person would hand it to somebody else. They'd copy it. And over time... They would copy it over and over again. The longer of, of, that you would write, the more mistakes you will find, and the more uh, words that are dropped and variations you find. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever played the game telephone, and you say something in somebody's ear over here, you whisper it, and it goes all the way down here, and you get here, it doesn't resemble that at all. And so the number of copies matter. If there's no copies, we don't know how much has changed. But if we have a, a, a huge amount of copies, we go, oh, this one dropped a word, but all these didn't. So we now have more evidence that when we are, what we are reading today, we can believe with certainty was what the original writer wrote. So the number of copies matter. Stay with me. I'm not done. We're gonna, this is gonna, I'm going to bring it home in a minute. The second thing, not only how many copies 
of that writing exists. But secondly, how much time has elapsed between what the original writer wrote in the original manuscript and the first copy? Again, somebody writes this, and if it's a long time before we show, we get the first copy, we don't know how many changes or what took place during those many years. So let me, let me just jump into this. Let's get practical. How many of you know, can know of, uh, heard of a guy by the name of Plato? Okay. Not Plato, our kids play with down below. And not Pluto. Plato. He was a... In the 400 B.C., he was a mathematician, a philosopher, in the natural scientists, a lot of the science, very influential in our lives today. He he was brilliant when it came to math. Brilliant. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard one of your professors get up and say to you something like this? We don't know if Plato even existed. And we're not sure that any of these writings are really his because it was so long ago that, man, things have changed. You ever hear that? Okay, so let me me show you something. I'm going to put a grid up here. So here we have Plato, and he's the author, and we have, of his work, 210 copies of what he wrote. He, He lived in 400 B.C., do you know that it's 1,300 years be- between when he wrote and the, his, the first copy shows up? 1,300 years. So what do we have here? A lot of changes could take place, right? 1,300 years. We, we don't know who copied it. We don't know what happened. But we don't have any professors telling us this is not valid. How many of you have ever, uh, have ever heard of a guy by the name of Julius Caesar? He wrote a book called The Gaelic Wars. We learn all about the wars from this particular time. Matter of fact, we've actually adopted as a country, a military, some of the, the strategies that he talked about in the Gaelic Wars, this book that he wrote. And uh, some of the governmental principles that he wrote about are actually part of the United States. Influential. Let's take a look here. Julius Caesar, how many copies of that do we have? 251, that's better. Are these numbers good or not? Just, we're going to have to wait and see. Now it's getting a little shorter. Between when he wrote it, 950 years before the first copy shows up. It's a long time, right? You ever hear a prof say, uh, we're not sure Julius Caesar even existed. We're not sure that these are his writings. No, we just read the books and we say that's true. Because they have passed the test of historical criticism, but we got this big gap that's problematic. Uh, anybody have to in school read Homer's Iliad? Oh man, my, I want to just rub my head when I. So my my teacher told me that this was a poem, a poem, five hundred pages long, poem, fifteen thousand nine hundred and sixty three lines, a poem. That's not a poem. That's a mini series. That is not a poem. Uh, let me show you what a poem is. Roses are red. Violets are blue. I think the Iliad's too long. How about you? Uh, that's, that's a poem. But our, our teachers made us write it. Uh, read it. Long work. So, so here we have it. Let's take a look at Homer's Iliad. How many copies? 1800 plus this by the way is the this is the standard everybody agrees that there is nobody as far as writings of antiquity nobody has it better than this this other than the new testament which we'll talk about in a moment 1800 plus copies and only 400 years so the less time in there the less chances of it getting all whacked out and all of a sudden we don't know what happened in those 400 years but all of a sudden it appears but nobody ever says to us we're not even sure this is really homer's writing we just believe it with confidence that this is true let me see what the new testament is check this out want to guess anybody 
over 24,000 copies in only 25 years. We, we, within 25 years of the first New Testament writers, we start seeing copies. Some are complete works, some are little segments, some are they're written on parchment paper and got little pieces together. Nothing touches the, 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 uh, the uh, walking, taking a, 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 a piece of antiquity and walking through critical, historical criticism of a piece better than, better than, the, than the New Testament. Absolutely remarkable. Here's what that means. You cannot choose to believe this. You can choose to not believe this. But you cannot say that those of us who do believe the Bible to be the inspired Word of God have checked our brains at the door. You cannot say that. Why? Because the Bible is the single most documented source of historical antiquity. Nothing is better than the Bible. Let me tell you the second reason why I believe the Bible. Here it is. It is historically accurate. In the Bible, the Bible contains thousands, literally thousands of dates, names, and places that can be verified or disproved. Thousands of them. We have names of generals and kings and princes and world leaders. We have dates of global events, political takeovers, and military battles. And we have places where, where military battles took place, natural uh, disasters occurred. The Bible is specific. And did you know, listen to this, that there are over 23,000 archaeological digs that prove the authenticity of Scripture now, let me just tell you something. Don't assume for a moment that those who paid for these archaeological digs were all favorable to Christianity and the, and the, the reliability of Scripture. The, many of these digs were done to, to prove that the Bible was not accurate. 23,000 different archaeological digs and not one, not one, one, not one of those has caused us to have to change anything that is in this book. I'm not talking, oh, there's only eight we had to mess with. Not one. There's a fellow by the name of William F. Albright, argue, arguably the greatest archaeologist who has ever lived in the United States for sure. He has his Ph.D. from John Hopkins University. He directed the oldest American research center of the Near East Studies in the Middle East. When he died, matter of fact, he had made such an influence that they changed the name of the research center to the Albright Institute of Archaeological Research. Listen to what he says. It's on the screen in front of you. Archaeology is a vast subject today, having specialized facilities, institutions, textbooks, and specialized journals all around the world. In the last century, rationalist critics were of the general opinion that with the growth of this subject, the Bible will be disproved and rejected eventually. But just the opposite has happened. Things disputed by the critics have turned out to be the way they were described in the Bible. The Bible history was confirmed like, listen, no other ancient book in the world. Also, there have been many cases when the wrong notions of the archaeologists were corrected by the Bible. There is at least one case in which a non-Christian archaeologist became a Christian when he saw the amazing accuracy of the Bible. It is historically accurate. Here's the third reason why you need to believe the Bible. It's this. It was written down by eyewitnesses. So you have, it's the most reliable collection of ancient writings when it's, it stands the test and scrutiny of, of a historical criticism. And it's 23,000 digs, historically accurate, and it's written down by eyewitnesses. What you and I read in the New Testament and the Old Testament is by and large mainly written by people 
who saw with their eyes, heard with their ears, experienced it themselves, lived it out themselves. We're, we're not talking about a legend that is handed down from, from generation to generation. We're talking about historical eyewitnesses. Now, these people were credible sources. I don't know about you, when I grew up, I, was, uh, I liked watching crime dramas. Crime dramas. I mean, uh, we watched, how many of you remember Quincy? Quincy had a crime and he had to figure out all this stuff. Uh, how about uh, Barnaby Jones was another guy? I don't know why that show became popular other than the fact that nothing else was on TV. But it was a show, right? And my favorite, of course, we had Hawaii Five-0, which is still on today. New actors, of course, really fun. And, and Magnum P.I. And then the all-time favorite, Andy Griffith. You know, all right, there you go. Awesome times, right? I love crime dramas. And I, I watch them to this day, by the way. You, you want to kill a crime drama, no pun intended, really quick? Introduce an eyewitness to the crime in the first five minutes. Show's over. You have a crime, but no drama. These guys who are writing scripture were eyewitnesses to what took place. I hope that this changes the way you read this book from now on. You're reading the most historically accurate drama, uh, document in the history of the world. It's been proven historically accurate by 23,000 archaeological digs. And it's written by people who lived it, who saw it, who heard it, who experienced it. They're writing about what they saw. Listen to how John says, he's one of the disciples of Jesus. He says this in John 1, 1 through 4. He says this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, he's talking about Jesus, we have heard, see that? Which we have seen with our eyes, eyewitnesses, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it. And testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. John says, listen, let me tell you what we saw. We saw eternity. God took on flesh. God lived among us. God went to the cross. God died for us in our place. And God rose again. And we saw it. We experienced it. We are eyewitness testimony to it. Now let me just tell you something. When these guys wrote this stuff down, they were in the extreme minority. Christians were an extreme minority. It does not make sense at all that these people in the extreme minority would have written down some fabricated story about a Jesus who died on the cross and rose from the dead and not have the majority stand up and scream, that never happened. But do you know something? There is not one paragraph, not one sentence that is written to discredit and disprove what these apostles are writing. Not one that can stand the test of historical accuracy like the Bible does. Nobody says a word. Now let me add to you something here. Many of these New Testament writers were killed for believing what they said is for saying that we saw this. They didn't just believe it, they were witnesses to it. People, people say, well, well, Rich, there's lots of people, religious people, who die for a lie. Yes, you're right. There are people, we have extremists in the world who are dying for a lie, but they are being deceived. They're being told about something. What you and I have are people who were eyewitnesses to Jesus. Eyewitnesses and said, we, look, you can put a gun to our head, you can do whatever you want to do, but I'm going to just tell you something. We're, pull the trigger because we are not changing our, what is true. We saw it. Here, here's the fourth reason why you need to believe the Bible. 
It comes from God. Remember when we were reading at the beginning, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we said all Scripture is breathed out by God. It means that this book says of itself, this comes out of the mouth of God, this is from God, it is inspired, and the early church understood that the Holy Spirit descended upon prophets and uh, apostles, and God used the personality and the traits of the individual who was writing. That's why when you read Peter, Peter's a fisherman. He doesn't talk the same way that Paul does with his eloquent speech. He was academically trained. And they have different personality. God used these personalities. The, the apostle, the prophet would write using their own personality and whatnot. But the message is from God. The message comes from God. This is what Peter talks about when he, 2 Peter chapter 1, he says this. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from one, someone's own interpretation. Paul's saying this, listen. The, this writing is not our ideas. This writing is not some clever thoughts that we came up with. Look what he says in verse 21. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So Peter says, hey, what you are reading, what you are hearing is not from us. I know we're a part of the, the, the chain here, but it's not from us. It is from God himself. And so you say, okay. Rich, are you saying that this book is from God no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying, it is what the most reliable book in the history of the world that has test, been tested by historical criticism, that has stood the test of scrutiny and criticism, it is what the book that has proven to be accurate, even though there are 23,000 archaeological digs. It is the book that filled with testimonies of eyewitnesses, most of whom died for believing and, and writing this stuff. It is what that book says about itself. You say, well, I, I don't believe that. And that's okay. But based on the evidence, you've got to deal with this book. You say, Rich, is there any evidence that this book is from God? Yes, I'm glad you asked. Finally, I'm so glad you asked that. There's two things that give evidence that this book is from God. The first evidence is the way that it was written. There's something very, very unique about how the Bible was written. All the other religions, there's other books that claim to be God's word and they're holy books and they're claiming to be inspired by God. But they all have something in common. The Bible's different. They all have something in common. They're written by one person and sometimes a few of their immediate followers. And they're written during a singular time period. That's true of every religious book you look at. So let's, let's take, for example... Um, Let's take, uh, let's take Islam, one of the biggest uh, religions in the world today. It is written by one man, Muhammad, who claimed to have a vision from God. He wrote it during one time frame. That's it. Well, let, let's go to another group. And I, I'm, I'm not trying to be offensive to anybody, but I'm going to just tell you, I, I'm, this, is a, uh, this is being intellectually honest with our facts. Let's take a look at the Mormon, Mormonism. Mormons, have, Mormons, too, have a holy book. It's called the Book of Mormons. Written by one man, Joseph Smith, at one time period. Now, you would think that these books that are written by one man in one time period, that they would be able to stand the test of historical criticism that we just put the Bible through. And yet they fail miserably. The, the places they talk about never existed. There's no evidence. They fail miserably. And yet, you take the Bible. 
The Bible is written by six, in 66 different books. It's written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It's written on three different continents, Asia, uh, Africa, Europe. Written by 40 different authors over a period, listen, of 1,500 years. What's that mean? What's the big deal? It means that these 40 authors did not get in some room someplace and agree upon a story. Most of these guys didn't even live in the same millennium of one another. And that there's a consistency of story, a consistency of a message from God. You say, Rich, how is that possible? I'm glad you asked. The Bible says all Scripture is breathed out by God. God didn't have to get in a, he's outside of time. He didn't have to get in a room with anybody. He's God. He used the personalities and the traits of the authors and he gave it to them. And then they wrote it down for you and for me. <laughs> There's a guy that I've talked about before. His name is Josh McDowell. Josh McDowell went to USC. And while he was there, he was studying a law. And he was invited as a young college student to go to a Bible study. He was curious, so he went to the Bible study, and he had these friends. He really liked them. He said they were smart, but there was this one problem. They believed the Bible to be the literal word of God. It drove him crazy. It actually made him mad. He dropped out of school, and he took five months to try to disprove and dis to discredit the, um, the Bible. So he gathered a whole bunch of books around him, all the books that he thought he would need, and he, he went away. Five, for five months, locked himself in a cabin. He says that he spent over a thousand hours, 1,000 hours of studying. After five months, he emerged from that cabin, and this is what he wrote. The Bible was written over a period of about 1,500 years in various places, stretching all the way from Babylon to Rome. The human authors included over 40 persons from various stations of life, kings, Peasants, poets, herdsmen, fishermen, scientists, farmers, priests, pastors, tent makers, and governors. It was written in the wilderness, a dungeon, inside palaces, and prisons, on lonely islands, and in military battles. Yet it speaks with agreement and reliability on hundreds of controversial subjects. Yet it tells one story from beginning to end. God's salvation of man through Jesus Christ. No person could have possibly conceived of or written such a work as this. At the end of 1,000 hours of study, Josh McDowell yielded his control of his life over to Jesus Christ. And for 50 years, he traveled across the United States visiting university and colleges to share the truth that the Bible is the living Word of God. I just, uh, in January, I had reason to be down in Southern California, and I, I got to hang out with Josh for a little bit. Uh, his son and I are friends, and actually his grandson I know as well, so we kind of, and I, I got to tell him, I, he's 84 years old now. I, for some reason, I think he's shrinking. He's about this tall. I mean, he just keeps on going. But great guy. I just thanked him for the influence he's had on my life and so many countless other people's lives because of his writing. So number one, it has signs that it is from God by the way it was written. Pete group, 1,500 years. Here's the second one. What was written in it? When you understand the historical credibility of this book, you've got to pay attention to what it says on the inside because there's pretty amazing stuff. One of the amazing things is this. Listen. I know we're, we're, time's wrapping up. There are over 50 prophecies. Listen, 50 prophecies about the coming Messiah in the Old Testament. 50. They're specific. They are, um, they're not like general, like, oh, you know, the Messiah sometime in his life is going to wear a blue t-shirt. None of that. Very specific, like... 600 years before Jesus is born, that he would be born of a virgin. No human dad. 600 years. That's, that's pretty detailed, right? You know anybody who's been, has no human dad? Here's another one. Micah says 600 years before Christ as well. Micah chapter 5 says that he would be born in Bethlehem. 
600 years before he's born. Anybody get to choose the place you're going to be born? 1,000 years before. The Messiah would be born of the, the family of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob's family, the, uh, of the tribe of Judah, and then he would be born of the household of David. Anybody get to choose your great, great, great grandpappy? Specific details. So we asked ourselves the question, what, oh, matter of fact, one more, I got to just jump in here. Psalm 22 and Psalm 35 and Psalm 41 says that some 600 years before Christ, let me back it up, 600 years before crucifixion is invented as a means of torturous execution, it says that he's going to hang on a tree and die there. So what are the odds of all that, right? You kind of wonder. So there's a guy by the name of Peter Stoner, and he, actually mathematicians have tried to say that it is a mathematical improbability. It's impossible for Jesus, one man, to, to fulfill 50 prophecies. So this one guy, Peter Stoner, comes along and he writes this book, Science Speaks, and in it he says, let's just take eight of the harder prophecies and we'll see what is the probability that one man just prof- accomplishes eight, not 50, just eight. And so what he does, he does the math, and it comes out as 10 to the 17th power. This is what it looks like on the screen. You know, that's a big number. It's almost as big as my credit card debt, but I, I'm having a hard time trying to figure out what would that look like. Well, let me something Peter Stoner went on. He says, okay, so what it's like is you get silver dollars, and if you get this many, 10 to the 17th power, you get several dollars, get silver dollars, and you, uh, you cover the state of Texas. It's a big state. Cover it, and if you put this many silver dollars on it, it would be three feet high. Now he says, to, get, to help you out a little bit more, is you mark one of those with a red X, and you throw it out in the middle, you mix up the whole thing, it's all mixed up, and you blindfold so, some poor soul on the state line between Oklahoma and Texas, and you say, Keep your blindfold on. You can go out and you can choose any walk. It's a big state. You can go anywhere you want. Go out there and, and see if you can't find. You get one choice. You get to bring back one silver dollar. The chance that he comes back blindfolded with the one silver dollar with the red X on it is that number. And that's just eight. That's just eight. You say, Rich, how is that possible? All Scripture is breathed out by God. The story of the Bible is simple. There's a God who loves you. And the whole story of the Bible is, although there's sin in our lives, we're separated from God, that there's a plan that Jesus come and live his life to give his life so he could recon- be, you could be reconciled back to him. John 3.16 says this, for God so loved the world. He, that means, let's stop, let's take it apart. We've read this before, but he loves you. That he gave. What did he give? His only son. What's that mean? He gave his life. He stepped out of the throne room of heaven for you and for me. He went to a cross because he loves you. To pay for something you could never pay for yourself, your sin. That who, by dying on the cross and being raised, that whoever, I love that, whoever, See how inclusive that is? It's not just the spiritually holy people, you know, whatever. It's whoever, the sinners, everybody. That's all of us. Believes in him, should not perish, but have eternal life. You say, well, where, where is this found? It's found in the most reliable collection of ancient writings in history that has been proven historically accurate by over 23,000 archaeological digs that has been written by eyewitnesses, many of whom died for what they wrote, saying that there is a God who loves you, who wants to know you, that he died and he's coming back. 
And how do I know this? Because this book says so, and I do not have to check my brain at the door to believe it. You pray with me. Father God, thank you so much for just the evidence that is so powerful for us when it comes to the Bible. And here, here's this book that we hold in our hand. has been breathed out by you. Lord, forgive us because we leave this treasure on our shelves unopened. And Lord, this is your, your breath to us. This is the truth. In a world that's filled with lies and deceptions and fake news, this is truth. And Lord, as we live in a, in a culture where four out of five people do not believe what we believe concerning the Scripture, I pray that you would help us to understand that the Bible is reliable and have, have, the, have the logic and the reason behind it to say, stand confidently and say, this is true. This is true. Increase our faith, increase our belief, and may we read the Word of God and share the Word of God with confidence and boldness. Lord, again, I, if anybody's here today and has never trusted you as Lord and Savior, and, and now all of a sudden as we talk about salvation and we talk about being sinners and today, okay, if this book is true, then I, I really, it is really as bad as I think it is. Lord, I pray that right now they would just give their life to you. They'd ask you to confess. They'd ask them, you would ask them to, excuse me, they would ask you to forgive their sins. They believe that you're God and you died and rose. They give their life to you. Lord, thank you for the encouragement of the truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching Hessel Online. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can stay up to date on the latest content and share this with a friend. If you've been blessed by our ministry and want to support us financially, you can give through our app or click on the link in the description below. Thanks again for watching and may God bless you.